me introduce myself. My name is Mr. Matthew Trefuey. You can tell I'm a teacher because I've been calling myself a mister. Um, I'm the, the head of business and economics at Lord Anger International School, Hong Kong. And um, I have a, a deep personal interest in this topic. That's one of the reasons why I volunteered for the second time to host and deliver this webinar. And uh, just to give you some context about how this, how the next 55 minutes is gonna work. Um, I'll talk to you more about that, the breakdown, what's gonna be discussed. There will be opportunities for you to get involved and participate. So it's not just gonna be listening to me. I'm actively encouraging you to participate. And um, let, that brings us, that set gives me a nice segue into the housekeeping. So as already mentioned, please, um, mute your microphones unless you are speaking. Um, you're welcome to turn your cameras off if you don't want to be, because it's been recorded. But please keep your cameras on um, because it's great to see you as well as hear you. And if you do have a question when invited to ask questions, please raise your virtual hand and Sylvia will be able to communicate with me who that is. And then I can, um, I can bring you in to share your, your views and comments to the questions. There will be a, a breakout um, activity and I'll talk more about that later. So yeah, this topic's about neuroplasticity and uh, you're gonna be learning all about that and how we can um, leverage neuroplasticity to encourage unlimited learning in the classroom. So, for me, success today would be for you guys to all walk away from this webinar knowing more about what is meant by neuroplasticity and how we can embrace it, not just as educators, but as people ourselves, because we're always learning too, not just the people we, we have in our classrooms. And secondly, as, um, as a professional body of teachers and educators here, how can we use the science and the studies that show how neuroplasticity can be leveraged in the classroom. How can we use this from our existing experiences and what's, what's possible to increase opportunities for unlimited learning in, in our classroom? So that's the, the success criteria for today. We'll check back in towards the end to see what takeaways you guys have. So just to give you a roadmap of what this is gonna look like, all right? So we're already kind of into the first section. I'm going to be talking to you about neuroplasticity, not for long, maybe 10 minutes or so. I'll be sharing some stories, some of the science, some of the studies. And there is a question which I actively encourage you guys to participate in. And um, that will just be you sharing your ideas and comments verbally with the rest of the room. And then we'll segue into how can we leverage neuroplasticity to um, actively en enhance unlimited learning opportunities in the classroom. And that will involve a breakout room activity. Now, depending on the timings, um, you can have several minutes to work in groups based on um, you know, some, some ideas for questions, and then you can bring that back into the room and share your findings. And we'll finish off with some takeaways, some ideas for where you can take this next and any questions you may have. So let's jump in and look at neuroplasticity to begin with. So, I mean, you've got the definitions there you can read for yourself, but neuroplasticity, the way I look at it, if you break down the word neuro and plasticity, neuro is really about our minds, our, our brains, and plasticity in this sense means that we can mold, we can change our minds and our brains. Now, this is, this is very new stuff in the history of education and in terms of human existence. This has only been apparent in the last 20 years or so, since the millennium. Before that, the fixed brain model was very prevalent and it still is because old habits die hard. There was a belief that we, our brains expanded as we grew up and when we become um, elder children, teenagers, whatever, our brains stopped growing and our potential for learning was kind of capped there. Now that has just been debunked. It's a myth, it's not true. And science has proven that now. Science has shown study after study after study that our brains continuously change and we can grow and we can learn anything we want as long as we put our minds and our effort to it. And this has been proven by science. And the challenge is, is, is making this awareness more prevalent in our classrooms and in wider society so that people are more open to the fact that it's possible for any person 
to learn anything they want. Of course, there are some conditions for that, as in they've got to put work in, etc. But it is possible. And that's where neuroplasticity fits in today, is making that more aware and having the science to back it up. So I'm going to share with you a very short video. It's only two minutes. And this will hopefully explain to you what neuroplasticity is. So let's watch the video. Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. Hence, neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel, or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task, or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. It becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently, learn a new task or choose a different emotion, we start carving out a new road. If we keep travelling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. And you may notice that that video was produced in 2012. And I think that the, the narrator said in the last decade or so. So it just shows you that this science, this is fairly new. And because of that, it's still a lot of people out there unaware of it. And it's still the old model of fixed mindset, fixed brain is still very much out there. And we need to challenge that. So, Please allow me just to kind of just summarize what happened in that video. So what they were saying it was that whenever we, we learn something new or we do something different or we have a new feeling or an experience, um, we have these things called synapses in the brain and they're like new pathways. And when we do something new for the first time or learn something new, we create a new pathway. And if we continue learning the same thing or doing the same thing or having the same feeling, these pathways that are new and formed, they can connect with other parts of our minds and brains, and then they begin to strengthen. But there is a caveat here, because if we learn something new or do something new, and we don't keep it up, we don't continue practicing it, these pathways will just fade away. So it's almost like our brain is like a gym. It's like we don't go to the gym, our muscles get weak. If we don't keep learning or relearning what we, these new experiences or whatever they may be, these pathways will just fade away. And the, that's, the, that's what neuroplasticity is. We can literally change and mold our brains constantly depending on what we're focusing on. And that's completely new way of thinking to what was previously had as in our brains grow and then they stop. Now it's like, no, our brains are constantly changing each and every day. And that's, that's neuroplasticity. And there was some interesting research on this. Um, I'm from the UK, I'm not from London myself, but Part of the science which developed this theory of neuroplasticity was, was based on London taxi drivers. Now, if you want to be a London cabbie, cabbie, as they're called, it's one of the most intensive, difficult training in the world. London is a very complex place. It's very big. It's, if you want to become a cab driver, you have to pass something called the knowledge, which is a test. And it takes, on average, 12 attempts to pass this test, on average, around four to six years to study for it. The, the, the cabbies who want to become London licensed taxi drivers, 
they have to pass this test and they have to memorize 20, 25,000 streets, 20,000 famous locations and tourist places. And they can't just do it by memorization alone. They have to actually go out on the streets and drive these roads themselves. And what the scientists, the neuroscientists discovered by studying the MRI scans of London cab drivers was once they were licensed and they had passed the knowledge, a particular part of their brain called the hippocampus, which is renowned for spatial awareness, had enlarged, was larger than at the average person. And interestingly enough, when these cab drivers retired and they stopped working as a taxi driver, that, that area of their brain began to, began to shrink back to the normal size you would see in an average person. So that goes to show that London cab drivers on average are not children, they're adults. And by learning and studying this spatial awareness of locations and streets, whatever, they actually grew a part of their brain that demonstrated that they had learned something. And when they stopped working as a cab driver, it shrank down to relatively normal size. So that was an interesting uh, study that was done on this. So how does this all relate to education? Well, there is a big belief out there that student abilities are kind of fixed. I still see it, you know, I, I, even schools have gifted and talented registers. I'm sure they're not doing this because they want to um, not serve children, they want to serve children, but they, they do believe, there's a, there's a belief out there that certain children are able and certain children are not. And neuroplasticity just debunks all that. It just says everyone, including us, are capable of learning anything as long as you, as long as you put the effort in and put our mind. So if children are more aware of neuroplasticity, the fact that their brains are constantly changing and they can grow, this is good because it makes them more um, acceptable of the growth mindset model. And it makes them more willing to practice and make mistakes and take on challenges because it's not so much I can't do it, it's just like I, I can't do it yet. I need to keep working at this and eventually I'll figure it out. And really, this is really good because it stops us as educators labeling children as more able and less able. I don't do that anymore, based, partly based on this research and my own experience of things. And now I look at children and, ed, and, and anyone who wants to learn, I think they're all capable. They're all capable of learning anything. Some will take more work than others for sure. Um, and yeah, the, la the last point, we want to we wanna get away from labeling people as gifted and talented because that's really the fixed mindset model which doesn't relate to neuroplasticity. I just want to really quickly share an experience I had as a teacher a couple of years ago, which I, I found this out before about, I knew about neuroplasticity. I once had a group of about 10 mixed ability students for business studies. And I knew at the start of the year that some students were going to struggle. But I, I decided to run an experiment. I didn't judge anyone because I used to, because that was the kind of culture of they're able, they're not able. And I just said, look, I'm just going to use this 10 students. I'm going to teach them all the same way. And I'm going to teach them the best I can to pass an exam because that's I teach examination subjects. And at the end of the year, they all got the top, the top grade, which is an A star. I've never done that before. All students, that, despite their, their ability level, got an A star. And I was really surprised by the results. Yes, some of those students took more work than others. Yes, I had to work with them during lunchtime and after school. But they were all capable of getting the top grade. And it was because of my openness to think, well, they're all capable of learning. Whereas in my first few years of teaching, I would have been, okay, those less able students, I'll just probably aim to get them an average grade because that's all they're capable of doing. But this really happened a couple of years ago and it really opened my mind. I thought, oh my God, here are some people who I believed were not that good. And they just demonstrated that they are capable of getting the highest grade in my subject. And I surprised myself by that. And that really opened my mind to what's possible in terms of what, what we can learn. So I wanna pass it over to you guys. Um, here you go, is the think and share activity. I want you to consider, have you ever managed to teach something or perhaps learn something yourself that you initially presumed was too difficult to do? And if you can share a little bit about what happened, what did you notice and what did you learn? And just to give you some ideas, I mean, for me, I've always wanted to be an outstanding teacher. It took me nine years to get there. There were many times along the road that I thought I wasn't able to do it. I was plateaued. No matter what I tried, I couldn't get to that outstanding rating, which I thought was outstanding, what other teachers thought was outstanding. 
but I eventually got there in my ninth year of teaching. That for me was a struggle, but it was definitely worth it. So I'll give you guys a moment to think about that. If you do want to share, yeah, what, I'm very happy to have you come in. If you can just raise your hand and then Sylvia can tell me who you are and then we can give you the space to share. So in fact, Sylvia, I can see Connor here raising your hand. So Connor, do you wanna unmute yourself and, and share? Uh, hello everyone. Hi, Matthew. Um, this is really interesting. I'm enjoying the, the stack of this so far. Um, actually, just last week, um, this is actually related to my own learning. Um, and uh, I am not musical. I can't play any instrument uh, and I can't read music. And uh, when I was younger, uh, I went to a piano teacher and I just couldn't learn it. I just couldn't understand it. And um, uh, my partner is very, very musical and plays the piano, the guitar, the ukulele, uh, things that I can't do. And recently during lockdown, um, I sat down at the piano and she had some um, music, sheets of music on the top of the piano. And uh, I looked at it and it looked like double Dutch. Like, like I honestly, you can't understand how little I know about it. I, it was just lines and dots on a page. And, uh, and my partner sat down next to me and uh, she said, like, I can explain some of this to you. And uh, I said, look, people have tried before. My music teacher has tried before. I'm just not, I can't understand music. And uh, anyway, between the twos and the fro's, we continued and she explained and explained. And it took maybe 40, 45 minutes. But uh, by the end, uh, I could read the, uh, the C, the D, the E, the F, the G, the notes, the things that I, I hadn't known before. And uh, it, it really surprised me because um, I really just, I suppose, I understand growth mindset and I use it in my classroom all the time. But it shows just how far we have to go in making that growth mindset uh, kind of a normality. Like It's something I've taught to my kids at the start uh, of the year. But yet when I sat down in front of the piano, I immediately assumed, okay, I can't learn this. There's no point. Someone has tried this before and it didn't work. And um, so that was kind of eye-opening for me that there's still a, a journey to go. That's fantastic, Connor. Yeah, and that, that's exactly it. It's going away from this, you can't, I can't, we, no, we can't, and shifting over to we can. And it's that, and we'll be talking more about that in the second half about how we can, um, uh, facilitate and encourage that. I think um, if anyone else would like to raise their hand and share, I, I'm, I've got one or two minutes for that. If not, we can just move on. Just then I can see Thomas has raised the little star a few times. Okay, please. Uh, <laughs> please come in. No, I, I did raise a star. The um, star, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I've learned to do that a long time because I have great um, colleagues and I've got a number of superb colleagues um, here today. Um, so I was, in, I was just raising it, not for myself, but just to say uh, wonderful um, risk takers, um, great job trying to come out and speak like that. So I'm just cheering everyone on for being here to learn and, and realize that growth mindset is taking us forward into new places. So thanks for recognizing me, Ms. Sylvia. Okay, that's great. So I think um, just because of the timings, ladies and gentlemen, I think we better, we better move into the, the next part. Um, and that this is really about, okay, so we got neuroplasticity, we know the mind, it can change, it can, we can learn anything we want as long as we put our mind to it we, and we put the effort in. We don't have a fixed brain that's been proven now with science is how can we as educators um, um, incorporate this thinking and facilitate and encourage unlimited learning in the classroom. So uh, I read this book and I really encourage you guys, this, this is in the further reading at the end, and these slides are gonna be available on Chatteris's website later. So you don't need to write this down yet, unless you want to, um, but I really encourage you to read this book. Joe Bowler is fantastic. I, I, I got a lot of this information from her book today. And she talks about something called the learning keys. I think these are the keys that, that can open the door for unlimited learning in, in, in any room, whether it's our classrooms or a training room in a corporation anywhere. And I'm gonna share these learning keys with you. So I really ask you to listen closely because you're gonna be put into breakout rooms and I'm gonna get you guys working in teams to come up with what experiences have you seen in your classrooms? What, what could you experiment with? What could you add in to your classrooms to encourage this unlimited learning. Now we know that 
anything's possible. So the first one um, Joe Bowler talks about is challenge. Really interesting. And you, I'll let you read that for yourself. And what Joe Bowler is saying, and this has been, again been proven through science, and I don't have time to share the science with you today, but when we are struggling, when we are really struggling to learn something, that's when we actually learn more. This has been proven with MRI, MRI scans uh, on subjects. They shown that when people were struggling with math problems, their brains, the, 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 the electric currents were lighten up more than when they were getting things right. So when we are struggling, we learn more. So what I want you guys to think about later is how could you bring more challenge into your classroom? How are you doing it now? And how could you do it more in the future? And there was an interesting case study from Joe Bowler's book where she looked at mathematics lessons in mainland China in the United States. And I'm not trying to, hit, I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, represent the whole of the United States or, or mainland China with one case study, but this is what she discovered. Um, in math lessons in the United States, what she saw in her particular sample was there was lots of, um, um, lots of questions, but the questions weren't particularly difficult. So students were doing maybe 40, 50 uh, uh, equations, math problems in, in, in a lesson. But in, in mainland China, what she saw, interesting, that, they, that students were only working on one or two. And these questions were really, really tough. And when the teacher was explaining the question, the teacher may often deliberately make mistakes to make it even more challenging. So it was the, almost inviting children to, to tell the teacher, no, you made a mistake there. And if you were to look at league tables for math across the world at the moment, I believe, don't quote me, that mainland China math students are on a higher level than the United States. And I'm just using that because that was a case study from the book. So think about that in your breakout groups. How can you bring more challenge into your classrooms? Because our brains are working more when we're doing that and we're learning more when that happens. The next learning key was this one. I'll let you read that for yourself for a moment. Now this fits in nicely with the growth mindset model from Carol Dweck, all right? Basically, if we believe, if we believe that we can learn anything, we will. Whereas if we believe our minds are fixed, if we believe we can't, or we believe we're not good enough, that really limits our possibilities for learning. Now I'm showing you that slide there because Carol Dweck in her research, she, she took a bunch of math students and um, monitored them over, you know, seventh and eighth grade. Once the, 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 the way the experiment worked is that students were given math problems to work on and students were given feedback. And in the feedback, they either got two choices. Um, students were even told they were smart or students were even told that they really tried their best to, to solve a problem. And what, what, what Carol Dweck noticed was that the students who were told they were smart believed they, no, they believed they were smart, but as soon as they encountered something difficult, they, they chose to kind of choose the easier option out of that. They chose to work on simpler math problems. Whereas the students who were told they were really trying their best to learn something and solve a problem, those students inevitably were choosing more difficult maths problems to work on, even if they were getting them wrong. And as a, as a result of that, they were making more progress. So how does that fit into belief? Well, it's a belief uh, as in, if you tell students that their ability is fixed by saying things like you're smart, you're, you're being born with this, um, that can really stop them learning more than if they believe that they can learn anything. And it was another interesting thing in the book was what Joe Bowler said, feedback is really important as teachers. In one case study, um, one of the teachers, uh, or lecturers from university was writing on feed, I think it was, a, it was an English lecturer was writing on the feedback to um, English undergrads in the United States saying, they were giving them a bunch of written feedback. And at the end it said, I'm giving you this feed, feedback because I believe in you. I'm giving this feedback because I believe in you. And those students, because they were tracked, went on and performed at higher levels moving forward. I thought that was fascinating, just that one comment. Now that's not, a, that's not an invitation to go out there and start writing that on every, every student's work, but it was an interesting part of the research that came up. So mindset is a big one. 
Next one is a multi-dimensional approach. There's five, we're on number three. I'll let you read that for a moment. Now, what this is saying is if we can learn in lots of different ways, not just one linear way, but a multitude of ways, this can enable us to learn more. And there was, a, and it was an interesting um, example in the Joe Bowler's book where on, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen um, facing me, you got um, a way to um, give students ways to look at something differently. So you got a piece of paper, you can fold it and fold it again. In the middle, you can have a problem or a question or a task. And the four corners are just different ways to approach the task. And for example, if you look on the right-hand side, you know, facing you on your screens, you will see that there's a simple division there. And it's just, there's just a bunch of questions and there's only one way to kind of work it out. Otherwise, you could have looked at it completely differently. You, there's, if you want to work out 50 divided by eight, there are so many ways you can work it out. And by using your creativity and your innovation to think of how could we possibly demonstrate solutions to the same, same question, that really encourages brain growth and enables everyone to, um, to learn more. So when you think about new breakout, room, breakout rooms, how can we bring in flexibility and options for solving things, because apparently the study shows that really helps with unlimited learning. All right, number four, flexibility. I'll, I'll let you read that. Now, this was interesting as well, because again, from the research, um, it was based a lot on math students, but no, math is our, uh, our sample for today, because it's really about anything. And what Joel Bowler discovered um, was when we want to learn things quickly, that's not good. In fact, we learn more when we slow things down. And, we, and we're also flexible with how we learn. And um, this is another example here of being flexible. So if you wanted to demonstrate 20 times five or how, no, how to work out 90. There are multiple ways you can demonstrate that. I, I'll let you see that for yourself. I'm not a math teacher myself, but I was interested to see how you could demonstrate how to calculate 90 there. So we wanna be flexible and we wanna slow things down, not do things quick, slow things down. Because when we, when we speed things up, it causes stress. And when we have stress, it just limits our ability to learn things. Now, often, you know, we have the pressure of the clock in our, in our rooms, but if we can bring more opportunities to lengthen our tasks, give more time for thinking and reflection and more flexible ways to learn something. I mean, I teach business and economics. I mean, I can think of four different ways to teach things like um, exchange rates. It could, be, it could be write a poem. I'm just being very creative here. It could be draw a picture. It could be do a role play. It could be fill in, you know, write a definition, whatever it might be. These are all just examples how you could bring flexibility into it. All right. And the last one is collaboration. I'll just let you read that for a second. And again, the last learning key, but not, the, but not least, is just saying we learn more when we collaborate, when we work um, in teams, in groups. We bounce ideas off each other, and that enhances neural patterns and learning. Just a reminder, if you're not muted, please mute yourself, because otherwise you're, uh, you're cutting in. That's, that's okay. And so there was an, an interesting uh, case study here at Berkeley University of California. What they noticed there was um, particular ethnic groups were not performing as, as good as ever ethnic groups, um, in particularly the Afro-American um, African-American um, students in math were not, were not performing as well as say as the um, Asian American or American Asian. And what they discovered was interestingly, because they, they, were, they were curious to know what was, what, what was behind that. Was it, was it all these other factors? And they, 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 they studied that and they realized it wasn't that. But what they noticed was in, um, in, a, in Berkeley University of California, they noticed that the, Ameri the American Asian students were working together on problems. They were studying in study groups 
And when they brought that in with other groups of people, for example, the American, um, uh, the Afro-American people, they noticed that their performance got better just because they were working together on, on problems and, and problem solving and bouncing ideas off each other. So that was an interesting part of the research too. So they are the learning keys. I'm gonna just leave them there for you. And in a moment, Sylvia is gonna help me to put you into, into breakout rooms, not just yet, but I'm just gonna give you another 30 seconds to a minute just to look over those again, because I want you guys to talk about these new breakout rooms. So have a look at them again. And there is some information on the next slide, just to remind you. So what I want you guys to do in your breakout room is just, just to, you know, how can we leverage these learning keys to enhance unlimited learning opportunities? You might want to focus on one or more than one. Do you have any examples of best practice? And also, because there usually are, are there any barriers that could limit these practices? Um, and if it's possible to reduce these barriers, how might that be? So it's now uh, five past five. Um, Sylvia, can you put them in the breakout rooms for eight minutes? And then after eight minutes, we'll welcome you back. And I'm happy to take some sharing for those breakout rooms. Um, now, I would love to hear everyone share their ideas. So it's now uh, 5.14. We can go for about 10 minutes. So um, has anyone got anything they want to share regarding best practice, um, ideas, whatever, just raise your hands and then I can invite you in. That'd be, that'd be welcome. Um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what we spoke about in our breakout room, but um, I think a, a great opportunity for teachers in general, as it relates to neuroplasticity, um, you touched on it already, Matthew, but it's to really celebrate mistakes in the classroom and you know, that happens for Mr. Noel as well. It's not just the students who make mistakes. I regularly make mistakes as well. And I have no problem letting my students see that it's okay for Mr. Noel to make mistakes, get things wrong. And, you know, I've, I've really tried to embed that in them as well, that having a conversation or if I ask quite an open-ended question, that I've tried to instill in my class that, the important thing is that the discussion takes place and it's not necessarily, well, who's right or who's wrong. And I think that's a good starting point to, to celebrate your mistakes and that that's how it's part of our, how we learn. That's great. Thanks. No, I'm just, you know, I'm just curious. What do you teach? Uh, I'm a year four teacher and I teach IPC and then English math. All right. Fantastic. No, the answer is you teach learners. We all teach learners. We don't. We teach subjects yes. to learners. Yeah. Yes. Good job. All right. Um, anyone else would like to uh, to contribute to this discussion? Yes, uh, Nadine. Hi. I uh, yeah. I'll just follow on a little bit from what Noah was saying. Um, so I think like getting into the exploratory talk kind of thing. Uh, you were using maths for a lot of examples, but if you like use English for an example, um, the equivalent would be like using open questions or having discussions and, and kind of teaching students and like teaching or modeling the language so that they feel okay to express themselves and how to reply to each other as well. Uh, in our group uh, with Tom and Sari, we were just talking about like how, how young learners pick up language really quickly and how they end up using it in the classroom. So in those discussions, uh, using words like not yet, try again, um, all of those kind of phrases uh, to help them like not, not feel scared or embarrassed to have a go. Um, and yeah, I think especially with younger kids, I don't know too much about secondary, but I think um, that really impacts on their learning because they just get used to trying and doing those challenging things a bit more. Fantastic. Thank you, Nadine. Um, who would like to share next? You can raise your hands. James, please. Yeah, so um, I was telling Raquel that I really identify with the multidimensional approach. Um, at our school, we use the IPC and um, 
we teach in themes, units, topics. Um, and we have a big question at the start of each topic. And as you move through the subjects and you have those different perspectives and you look through those lens, different lenses, as we call them, um, it's really interesting to see the sort of visible learning taking place and then being able to articulate how that subject has impacted their answer to the big question. So it's, it's you know, it's a multi dynamic it's not maths. I know you pointed to that reference earlier or that subject earlier, but I think um, for the topic it's a, and themes, it's really, it's really interesting. And it, you, it's really pleasing to see that level of engagement as well. Fantastic. Thank you, James. Um, I think Sylvia, you're the best person to see hands raised. I've not seen them. So if you could just let me know. Uh, no, at the moment. Okay. So <laughs> what about, what, I mean, one of the things I, I, I noticed today was um, I was in one of my lessons today. I was teaching economics and uh, a student made a mistake. And I always know that it's almost like time slows down when students make mistakes. It's almost like, oh, what do I do now? Even though I'm a very experienced educator now, 12 years in. Um, but I always give the same feedback. I'm like, look, mistakes are great. And I said, look, I'm going to be doing a webinar later about neuroplasticity. Do you know what neuroplasticity is? It's got blank stairs. And I said, look, it's been proven through scientific research, you know, brain scans, that when we make mistakes, you know, our brains are really working. They're really firing up. We're learning more. And I want to encourage you to make more and more mistakes because we learn more. I don't want you to make mistakes in the final exam. That's not the idea, but it's great for the classroom. And I asked him, I said, well, how many of you guys are aware of this? Have you ever heard of growth, growth mindset? And a lot of them were just like, no. So for me, one of the barriers to all of this is that there's just a, a lack of awareness of all this kind of stuff. If the students don't know about it, then how many of the teachers don't know about it? And how much of the wider world does not know about this? So I would like to bring the discussion up on barriers. What barriers, I mean, look, challenge, flexibility, multi-dimensional um, ways of thinking, whatever, collaboration. These are all great ideas, but what barriers come up if we want to integrate this into our teaching? And has anyone got any ideas about that? Shannon would like to uh, share some opinion. Yeah, so we were talking about how it's important for teachers and students to have growth mindset but you kind of fighting parents as well because they teach their kids to have the fixed mindset. So you have to teach them to change that constantly. Yeah, I hear you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's my experience too, because again, this research is fairly new. You know, it was only come out from the millennium onwards, which is relatively recent. Uh, we've got a few minutes left guys. So um, yeah, any ideas, share the best practice. We've got some fantastic contributions so far. Um, anyone else? I got Connor. I got, you got, uh, would you like to come in, Connor? Uh, yeah, I'd love to jump in. And uh, I think it was number four was the um, allowing time um, kind of time and space to think. And uh, I'm wondering if you have any like ideas of, I often find that in a lesson, you are constrained by the clock. Even now in online learning, you have your 30 or 40 minute lesson. That's it. Um, like what kind of ways or what do you do to kind of allow that space for that computation to happen for that kind of? Well, if you're asking me, Connor, I don't have an answer. Or, or, or anyone, if anyone has any ideas, I, I, I know, I know, I don't expect a kind of a godlike <laughs> answer from you. Well, I, I just like, I'll just give my, I'll just give my response to that. Um, I, I would say one of the barriers for me is time for absolutely. It's time to create the lessons. It's time to bring the activities in. Um, so I look at this more as um, something that's ongoing, for sure. But I mean, the, the, the research has opened my mind tremendously. Now it's just looking at my, look at me as a, you know, I'm always developing, I'm, I'm a practitioner, I was always learning. I'm just bringing these things in bit by bit, step by step. So that's my response to that. Um, I, I think I saw, Shannon, did you raise your hand then? Did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I was just going to say it was something that we also discussed in our, our meeting that, you know, like when you give a kid the think pair share or if you give a problem in math, instead of saying, you know, when you've solved it, send me your answer. I always set like a two minute timer or depending on how difficult it is, you can have like a five minute timer 
But if a kid has answered it or solved it, then instead of rewarding them for being first and now they're done and they wait, ask if they can do it in a, in a different way. Can you think of another way to challenge yourself or another way to solve that? Or um, just kind of continue, kind of forcing them to, to think and slow down and you're not rewarding that speed, but you're rewarding the thought process and the learning. That's great, thanks Shannon. Um, maybe time for one or two more comments if anybody has anything. Um, if you could just raise your virtual hand, it's a lot easier to manage. Raquel? Raquel. Hi. So I think, um, I mean, I don't know. I obviously, again, I know what, I don't think anyone really knows the answer because each child is different, of course, and each classroom is different. Uh, but what I tend to do, I, I feel like if you want to, it, flexibility is key, is what I'm, what I'm trying to get out of my mouth, <laughs> is that if you have different children and you have, as, as Shannon said, there's the fast finisher, of course, you have an extra question to give them, or can you do it a different way, or can you explain to that child who's uh, struggling a, a little bit, or for those who are less able, you could even extend the time that they know, they may be that they even, even with the answer, after having answered the question, that they actually still don't get it. And, you know, you could support it afterwards, or you could uh, send it home, say, look, have a, have a think about it, and um, come back to me tomorrow morning. We have early work. We have quite a long, like half an hour in the mornings where we have time to talk to the children. So come back to me and we'll, we'll chat about this and see if you still don't get it. Then either I or the TLA can, can help. Equally with the challenge, I often do not answer challenges. Uh, if they can't get it, they can, well, they can go home and continue it or they can the next day yeah. try again. Uh, and that's just a way of just, not giving in and uh, promoting that open mindset that you were talking about, Matthew. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, Thomas, maybe uh, the final one from you. All right, thank you. Um, Shannon, great what you said. And with the pair share, I always do the point to my head, like think time, think time, think time. And I use a lot of, um, when I'm on campus, mini whiteboards um, and do the pair share there. Okay, ask the question, think, 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 building that routine so they know the routine. They're thinking, 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 then write your answer, pair share, very similar. And then when I say, okay, um, whatever my um, sign is to show, um, I'll, I'll usually say chin it, and then they hold it up. But they've got a chance with their partner to check and build the confidence, change their answer if they want. That's part of the think time. But the rush, as um, Matthew, you've said, is, a lot of times we're under clock time and people want to give an answer. Um, so the idea is to say, crawl, walk, run. People are sick of me saying that. They hear me say it all the time. But slow down, crawl, walk, run. Make sure a pair share, check it, then then do it. But it's the think time. And we've all played games of the you know little um, clocks we can spin or the um, sand clocks, that sort of stuff. But um, I think all of this is pair share and students had that um, neuroplasticity in their minds to learn these routines and to adjust them. And they'll remind you, they'll say, there was no think time. Thank you. You know, and building that so that basically we can step to the side and they're running it. That's great. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen with you guys. So I just got the, just to wrap this up. Going on here. Play, play from current slide. Okay, so yeah, just 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 to wrap this up. Um, you know, first of all, thank you so much for attending. It's been a great discussion. It's been great to hear all your um, ideas and experiences. Um, I've definitely taken something away. And the goal was really just to walk away with a better understanding of neuroplasticity, how we can embrace it ourselves and for our learners, and also to have a discussion and think about how can we embed more unlimited learning opportunities in the classroom now that we know science has proven it, that we can learn anything as long as we put our minds uh, to it. So I, I'm just curious, if you can just share your takeaways from this webinar, if you can just put them in the chat, that gives us an opportunity just to have a glance through those. You wanna go ahead and just type them in now.
And uh, I'll let people just continue writing those uh, messages and people can have a little look around and see what people have, uh, have taken from this webinar. And um, hopefully you found it useful and you can bring some of these ideas into your, uh, your, your, your teaching practice. Um, if you want to do some further reading on this, um, two books I highly recommend. I mean, Joe Buller, Bowler's book, Limited Mind, is fantastic. She's got TED Talks. She's all, a lot on YouTube, and you'll hear the same things I'm talking about because most of it's based on her book and her research. And obviously, Mindset by Carol Dweck is a fantastic book to read, um, which is all about the growth mindset versus a fixed mindset uh, model. So I highly recommend those books. Um, there are others out there, and if you are interested, you can contact Sylvia Chatteris, and she can put me in contact with you for further reading if you're interested. Um, so I just want to say thank you. It's been, uh, it's been fun. I really enjoy this topic. Um, I know myself. I'm a lot more compassionate with myself as a person because I know about this science. I can relate it to my own life. Um, I know that when I'm struggling to learn something, such as presenting webinars or um, speaking aloud in front of hundreds of people, it's okay. I'm learning, and that's good. And um, anything is possible. Um, and if I can't do something, I always add on the words, I can't do it yet. So I just want to say thank you, guys. Uh, it's been my pleasure. And I hope to see you again on another webinar.